Google Sheets where you can all just um, register for the training so that we have your correct name, correct spelling for your names. We hope to give you some certificates at the end of the training series. So please um, just complete the form. Um, the chat is there if you have questions and um, anything that you want to leave during the presentation, we can leave it there. Jeff will tell us if he will pause periodically to take those questions or he prefers to take them at the end. All right, so at this point, I'd like to just introduce our specialist for today and his name is Dr. Jeffrey Smink. And I, I, I just said Jeff, so he'll tell you his correct <laughs> pronunciation. Right, so he used to be an associate professor with the University of Alaska and is therefore used to teaching settings. So today I hope we will be some of his best students and that he will <laughs> enjoy being with us today. All right, currently, um, Dr. Smick is an agriculturalist and district manager in Alaska. Many of us have already heard of Alaska, probably meeting somebody in Alaska for the first time, like we did. So he will be able sure. to share some of the experiences there, similarities, differences, and all of that as he goes through his presentation. Okay, um, so Dr. Smick, he is also the owner and operator of Alaska Specialty Crops. It's a business that produces Irish potato seeds, which is one of our tier one crops here in Jamaica. So it's very good to have um, this expertise with us as well. So these seeds are sold to potato farmers who active, and he also actively works on developing new varieties. So he's like a researcher, an agriculturalist, and a project manager all embodied in one. Additionally, Jeff is a licensed pesticide applicator and will therefore have a good understanding of our own ways of managing our crops here in Jamaica. So we hope to learn more about that side of it. Dr. Smick is a practical and hands-on person nevertheless. He develops and rents specialized farming equipment. You can view some of his YouTube demonstration videos with these tools and we'll share the link with you in the chat throughout the course of the training. Today is our first session. So uh, it is my pleasure again to once more welcome, welcome you, Jeff, virtually to Jamaica. And we also look forward to a future visit when, when um, things are back to some form of normalcy. So at this point, I'll hand over to Jeff. He can tell you a little bit more about himself. Today is really for you, our participants. We wanna hear more from you. Jeff is new to Jamaica. He has not visited, so he's just in this virtual space with us for the first time. Today's session should be about getting some more information about who you are, what you're doing, you know, how many of you are actively growing and um, some of the issues and concerns you have. So I'll hand over to Jeff at this point, and he will tell us how he wants to flow. I don't have a presentation ready to okay. go because I'm not sure what we want to discuss at this point. So um, right. I, what I was really hoping for is if the growers can tell me about their operations and what issues they might have that I might be able to help with. So. Uh, if you don't mind an open question and answer, if we could just hear from the different locations, how they're growing, what they're growing, and what, what production challenges they have, I will try to keep some notes and then we can come up with uh, a strategy on what to present, what, what lessons to create if possible. Is, would that work? Sure, so at this point, we're gonna open the floor for right. discussions. So you are free to turn on your mic if you wish to speak. And as you speak, please introduce yourself and tell us where you are on the greenhouse spectrum. So today our focus is general agricultural um, greenhouse practices, good practices. So we're just focusing on you yeah. today. And then our next presentation will be a fully formal presentation from Jeff's side. So feel free to turn on your mic and ask your questions. Everybody shy? Mr. Williams is here, I don't see him. What is Not everybody yet. growing? My name is and I am not 
immediately involved in greenhouse farming, but it is something that I desire to do. So I'm just asking if this may be a call that I should be on, or maybe just for other persons who are already in that field. All right, so Anne-Marie, you so say you're not currently growing anything in a greenhouse setting, right? You mentioned something about a herbal I grow kitchen stuff. In, the, in the chat. Right. I operate uh, the herbal kitchen, which produces food for medicine and medicine for food. So I, I, I create my meals around using natural stuff. But my desire, because I have land, is to start growing my own vegetables using um, some, some different ways of doing stuff so I can get better yield and more nutritional stuff. Okay. So you will be basically um, going more organically, right? So your yes. interest would be more producing in a, are you doing in a shade house or are you doing it in the open field? Presently, I do small amounts just around my, my home, but I am looking based on what I am seeing and experiencing with persons wanting me to do much more would mean that I would have to consider doing this um, having my own space so I can have freshly um, grown vegetables and other stuff at the ready at all times. Okay. okay. That's, a, that's the advantage with um, this type of production system. You can do it year round once you have the proper you know, mechanisms in place and all of that. Jeff, anything to add to Anne-Marie? What crops are you right. interested in growing I want to grow gr lots of different kinds of greens um, that I use for salads and for uh, juices and, and so forth. Tomatoes probably and cucumbers and all those kind of vegetables, sweet peppers, so on. All right, thanks, Anne Marie. Yes. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I misread the, the thing, but because of my excitement and wanting to learn, I jumped on the call. Welcome, and we thank you for your input so much. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Hello, hello. I'm in the middle area. Is it Sheila? I, re I realized Anne-Marie wasn't finished. Nonetheless, my name is Shelley V. Smith. Shelley v. You probably never heard it before. <laughs> okay, so today I wear two hats. I'm an entrepreneur and I want to go into farming. Presently, I'm signing off with land from SCJ Holding. So they're starting me off with two acres. Other than that, I am the director of Import to Soar Foundation and we seek to reach out to persons who are you know less fortunate um we see to reach out to youths and one of the reasons why i connect is because personally we have as member over 70 farmers and also i engage um farming groups with over eleven thousand farmers and you know we try we have partnered with heart trust through the foundation to offer trainings in vegetable crop production um, with the farmers, which we have a few parishes and we still tend to work onward. The thing that I have recognized is that a lot of farmers are not really in, um, engaged or informed as much as they should about smart technology in farming. And that is what I, I want in my, my personal project for it to be all, all um, technology. Um, I did a trade with MED um, in aquaponics. And I love it. I love the setting the fact that you can be growing fish and vegetable at the same time in that one system. And we, I really want to learn more about um, hydroponics and the greenhouse technology in itself. And so to make a model so farmers, these farmers that are engaged, 
we can see that it is possible. But the, the other thing I, I, am, I want to present is, or I, I would like for you to touch on is different methods. Are there any different methods to reduce the expense? Because I realized that to set up a greenhouse structure, based on my research, it is uh, pretty much, and the foundation will reach out to find, to get grant fundings and so on. Um, so that's why I'm engaging with this because we, are, we have some proposals in and waiting on responses. As we know, we have you know different kind of organization that can guide us through the process, but no to, information is never too much. And therefore, mm -hmm. I am open to, to hear more, to learn more, so I can share with these farmers. Great. That's great, Shelly V. Shelly V, right? Got it. Right. Got and it. I, think, I think this is the important point, to, just to get the basic, because our focus is really today on the good agricultural practices, which we're doing, like just the basic stuff. What are some of the things that you need to consider before you even start? Because, you know, as you said, it, it's costly, but at the same time, does it pay for itself in the end? So yes, at the onset, it may be capital intensive. It may require you to put out a tidy sum, but over what period would you make that back as against another method? So thank you for that input. Um, and, and as I said, I have a personal project that I am planning, I'm working towards. I am interested in herbs and spices. So I still want to grow like um, peppers, and even though I learned that some of the some of these crops can you know function in open spaces, um, open field. So basically, I'd love if you could say to us what are the greater advantages growing in a greenhouse, a, a, a protected greenhouse system compared mm -hmm. to. Um, open field, especially for like crops that can, you know, be up, you can grow them in both settings. Right. Ms. Smith, what expenses do you envision and what do you want to reduce your expenses in? Okay, so as I said, we have, we have done applications in terms of grant proposals. For example, we, we seen an application in Ready2 and we had to get some invoices and so on. So one of the costing, and I had compared to another costing, um, for greenhouse, say, uh, a three, uh, 3,000 um, square feet greenhouse, uh, it is basically closely $2 million. Um, I've got another um, invoice that is, is really popping up to $4 million. And I, exactly, and I, I've been to, the, the one that um, give me the lesser rate, I've visited their farms and I've seen how they are, their work because they are using it too. So an average, I'd say pretty much $2 million. Mm -hmm. But also like the aquaponics, I did the training and basically we got um, you know all of the things that we would need, set up a system, a commercialized system, which is the largest, a medium size, and it too is looking at like 2.5. However, I've made contact with another person who have some smaller systems that can be at home. And these are like 250 that can, you know, you can expand on. But I believe that, you know, setting up a good established system that you can really model for, cause this is new to the farmers and people are tending to be shying away from it, especially with the expense. But to set up a, a, a mm -hmm. medium-sized commercial aquaponics, you're looking at $2.5 million. And you don't put in the seedlings yet. You don't get the, the, the material, anti-material. So that is what is existing presently. As I said, I've recently done some work, some research in order to create proposals. For that kind of money, you are talking about a very, very sophisticated system. Uh, I teach a course out in Alaska's rural communities, which is essentially an island. There are no roads to these communities. So you have to come in by an airplane. And we build greenhouses in these communities for $1,000 American. What? Wow. Wow. <laughs> so to, to, to me to hear millions of dollars, I'm hoping that the Jamaican dollar is not the same value as the American dollar. No, 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 but no, what, no, no, what, what, what you say, when you said a, a thousand, that's pretty mm -hmm. much probably 
It's not even 150. Well, I, I don't know what the US so, rate is, but we probably could round it off. How much? 140. Oh, pretty much 100. Let's round it, say 150. 150,000. That is fantastic. What yes. size no, is no, that? No, 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 ma'am. 1,000, not 150,000. No, no, and that no. includes the price of the it's... airfare. Ah, okay, I got you. But nonetheless, <laughs> Equivalent to your 1,000, I am thinking is a pretty much 150,000 our dollars, mm -hmm. American dollars. That's what I'm saying to you. <laughs> that is very affordable, I would think. Ours are very unsophisticated. We can okay. go to our local hardware store and mm -hmm. buy uh, a, sh basically it is a shed made out of aluminum poles and there mm -hmm. is a canvas covering. So that kit is $400 American. And we take it apart. We can fit it onto tiny airplanes, fly the kit out. And they, they, they are small greenhouses. They are only uh, 12 foot wide by 20 foot long. So they're not nearly the size that you're speaking of. Uh, and, and then we just cover them with, cover with, them with plastic. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So that's introducing the idea that um, and the concept behind greenhouse or what we prefer to call protected agriculture is that, you know, there are ways and means to do it. You may not start at 3000 square feet. Maybe you break that up into four and yes. you could start at 500 square feet. Definitely. And then you add to it as you go along, but you do it in such a way that it will lend itself to taking the addition. But you know, Jeff is bringing the concept that at the end of the day, you don't have to start with that yes. large square footage, especially if you're getting, if you're new, if you're new to it, because you'll, you'll have to learn about the crop, you'll have to understand the production system and all mm -hmm. of that. So that's part of the, the advantage of starting small. You learn as you go. That, mm -hmm. is, that is so good. I thank you so much, sir, for answering that question so promptly. I'm feeling excited already. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you wish to look a bit more into what we do, uh, the company that I have access to here in our local stores, the name of the company is Shelter Logic. And they make Good. Shelter Logic, and they make uh, kits where you can have uh, instant garages. And my daughter and I, we, we set built one of these kits on the on the farm here and it took us an afternoon to build that 12 by 20 kit just to make sure that we knew what no. to do when we got to the location so it only takes a, a a few hand tools and some carpentry tools and it it goes very quickly so when i have workshops in the remote communities it's usually a one day event maybe two days Okay. So, so um, I, I'm, I'm, ex I'm thinking that you've had experience, since you have had experience, you probably could say, you know, in terms of, is it that durable, just the same as the others, I'm just testing, measuring while I go. It is not durable. It is so inexpensive that if a storm comes through, I tell the customer, just cut the plastic, just sacrifice the crop because yeah. the structure it's, is not going to stand up to either your hurricanes or our violent storms here. Okay. It, it is a different strategy. So yeah. for a million dollars, I would have a very strong high tunnel or greenhouse that would stand up to a hurricane. For a thousand dollars, I sacrifice the contents and don't destroy my frame. I just cut the plastic and walk away from it. Okay, so that that is saying to me that it's um, planning is important also, ex especially to say when we are going to expect an hurricane season. So if I'm gonna start with this, I'd prefer I'd better um, start with a certain time of the year to experiment and see how, how useful it is. Not just for the high tunnel, but for your crop production. Okay. So they work together. This assembles so quickly that here in Alaska, we because we have so many feet of snow coming down, very few people would keep their high tunnel covered or greenhouse 
they would not keep it covered year round because the snow would cause it to, to collapse and fail. Oh. So all of our growers will start to put the, the plastic on their hoop house or high tunnel in usually April so that the majority of our snow is done and they can get their crop ready. So the house is protected when we don't use it and the, the farmer, uh, they know they're going to assemble their house a week before they're going to start using it. Okay. That, that's how that's they protect good. it. All right, great, thank you. Here in Jamaica as well, when there's a hurricane, an impending storm or hurricane of a certain um, level, greenhouse growers sometimes tend to do that. They roll back the plastic, they lower the plants just to anticipate and wait for the storm to pass. And then they, they go back in and they restore the plants, put them back on their trellises, return the plastic, that type of thing. Right, so the structure, we're starting at a good point. And the idea is um, your structure is important, but it should not be a deterrent because there are other methods, other types of structures that you can look at as in the one that um, Jeff has suggested. You, you may not need to import it, but if you see what um, it looks like, you can probably model it just by going to your local, you call hardware store. All right, there's a question. Can I read it, Mr. Sim? Oh, it says, um, I have a water system that eliminates chemicals and increases chlorophyll by 30%. Been looking for this a while. Uh, what's, what's to take on that, Jeff? She says, I have a water system that eliminates chemicals and increases chlorophyll by 30%. I have no idea. How do they measure that? And why is that important to you? Is anybody, I don't know what Mary? the chat is saying. Yeah. And Marie, how do you measure to know that it's... Um, 30% increase. The system has been around for a while. It is something that is used in um, Europe and Japan and Australia. But I've had the system for a while and trying to find a way to use greenhouse, um, a greenhouse system, how to set it up so that I can install the system using regular water than um, not being nearby uh, a river or anything like that. I can use any kind of water. Oh. Is it a filtration system or why do you want to invent your own irrigation system? That sounds like a lot of work to me. I, I understand, Jeff, but it is um, it's not a lot of work and that's why I was very excited, excited about it. It is a simple system that you... Uh, um, to put in, um, even now a tank with water that I've seen really, but in small areas and see the results. The, the big thing about what I'm looking for is learning how to set up the greenhouse so that I can maximize on it, getting more stuff done. I, I would like to caution you about learning too many pieces at one time. If yes. you are trying to learn how to build the greenhouse, I would advise you to not try to learn how to do a new irrigation system. Work at one system at a time because otherwise, if something goes wrong, you don't know which piece is the trouble. You have too many things going on. Okay, okay, thank you. Jeff, there's another question. Um, Andre is asking, how do we make a greenhouse resilient to drought and flood? Again. Flooding is very difficult because it's out of your control in general. If that's what you mean, if, if the creek or river is rising and floods you, that is nothing you can do 
with your greenhouse. The other way around is um, a bit more easy to work with. One of the best strategies for making a greenhouse or any soil resilient or resistant to drought is to have a lot of organic matter. The organic matter acts as a wonderful sponge in the soil. So when it does get water, the organic matter itself will absorb the water. And then when it goes through a period of no water, then the plant is able to pull the water out of the spongy organic matter in the soil. I would think though, as we look at the higher value of a, a shade house or greenhouse, you don't want those plants to be under drought stress anytime because that's lost money from your pocket. It is, a, it is one of the biggest priorities here in Alaska for greenhouses to never let the plant be thirsty because you sell water. <laughs> you sell water in the form of a tomato or in the form of a pepper. If I can constantly keep water into those plants, those peppers will be as juicy as possible. Those tomatoes will be as sweet as possible. And if you're getting paid by the pound, you are selling water. So never let that plant get thirsty. Great response. Right, so, so Jeff, you're saying that in terms of the flooding, having that, that buffer is always good. But I think importantly, the first thing is selection. You need to have proper site selection when you're gonna build a greenhouse. If you know, as Jeff said, if the creek, the river runs this direction, you know that there's no possibility that a greenhouse will, um, will do well there because they're going to have humidity and all different disease and pest problems. So the first thing I think, um, was it Dwayne who asked the question? The idea is, where am I going to put this greenhouse? You don't just go on a piece of land and because that space is available, you just put a greenhouse there. I think Jeff can probably elaborate more that the way you orient that house is very important. I would prefer to put the house on higher ground if possible. Let it flood outside of the greenhouse, but not in the greenhouse. Make sure that there's good drainage that when a heavy rainstorm comes through, it sheds off the house and that it has a way for that water to leave the area. We we have this issue in Alaska, even though we have a very dry climate, when we have three or four foot of snow next to the greenhouse and it melts, then we have it very wet outside of the greenhouse and that moisture moves through the soil. So we have to get rid of that snow so it does not melt next to the greenhouse. You don't have to worry about snow, but it may be worth making a drainage ditch outside of your greenhouse so that as the water comes off the greenhouse, it leaves the area and doesn't have a chance to flood the area. So to me, if you could put the greenhouse where it is higher than the surrounding area, then the water has some place to go to. Right. And as Jeff says, we are selling water. And at the end of the day, if you have a greenhouse, remember it's a roof, it's a surface area, it's naturally going to collect water. The idea is that water should not be wasted. We should really be collecting every drip of that water to be fed back to the plants. So this is a very good question and, and comment, um, Andre. Thank you for that because a lot of times persons in the past have come and said they want to set up greenhouses. And when I probably have a discussion with them, I let them know the water requirement to run a greenhouse, the, 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 the nutrition required, it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody because it requires a certain level of... Um, you know resources and so if you need you you cannot you cannot starve a plant and expect to get good production jeff makes the point several times we're selling water so i think one of the most critical element in greenhouse production is water storage water accessibility water quality everything water i learned for the first time today that we're selling water <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> That's so hilarious. But in essence, 
nobody wants to go and buy a shriveled pepper, a shriveled tomato, a shriveled cucumber, do we? No, no. what you're buying is a lush tomato that was fed for the life of the crop with water. So thank you so much for, Je for that, Jen. Um, can I is ask a hand a question? Up? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't put my hand up. But just a quick question, as Jeff mentioned, the water. I am thinking, can we harvest that water? Is the system strong enough? Have you ever done it? Where you can have the little gutters and, and, and the shed the top there in order to catch this water. Can that be done? Because I've, I've been looking and I have not really yes. seen one yet where they are harvesting water from the, the, oh, the, the top, the roof of the um, greenhouse. So it's something that I have in mind to do. But tell me, do you think this is possible? It is very common for us to capture the water because many of my growers that I work with do not have electricity. So they don't have the ability to pump water. So they are collecting it from the roof of the greenhouse through gutters. And then from the gutter, it will go to uh, the recycled 300 gallon uh, container tanks. Uh, we call them IBC, uh, uh, but they are basically the cubic containers that are all over the world chemicals and large food quantities are shipped in them. They are 275 or 300 gallons. They are all over the world and they're wonderful plastic containers. So they will hold 300 gallons of rainwater. And that way, when they need the, the water for the crop, they will just uh, either use buckets or pump out of it with a little tiny solar powered pump to uh, push that water back into the greenhouse for the plants to use. But 55 gallon drums, uh, some people will actually use uh, inexpensive swimming pools, anything to hold water. Oh, thank you for the pictures. Yes, yes. Um, these are pictures of some um, greenhouse and these are the pond is one of the first things that they put in. And uh, These ponds serve probably 25 houses you know, if you only have one house, you won't need this size, right? <laughs> and they, and they, the, the roofs of the house is they have these gutters on it. So the water comes down at the gutters and is piped towards the pond. And um, some of the systems also have a solar so solar panels that return the water um, to the top. So the, the, pump, the pumps are run by solar because uh, most of the time that you're watering is actually when the sun is out. So the, the two of them work hand in hand. But as Jeff was saying, you don't have to have all of this um, infrastructure. You can be using buckets or, or drums. Um, drums like these are um, gravity feed. Yes. Jeff, another question, please. Um, what type of soil is best when building a greenhouse or any soil can be used? Any soil can be used. Uh, <laughs> if I have my choice, I prefer to use a sandy soil and I like to be able to control water. So if I have a soil that is sandy, I can control exactly how much water my plant roots have. Uh, the reason I like to control water so much is the balance between earning money by selling water. So having the right water to the plant is wonderful, but there are a number of plant diseases that thrive under conditions where the roots are wet. So if I have a sandy soil, if I'm starting to get Pythium, Phytophthora, some of those other root diseases, I can turn the water, not irrigate so heavily and let those drain out because the sand will also drain the water very quickly. So if I have my choice, I like sandy soil that has lots of organic matter in it as a sponge. But where I live here, we have silty soils and they grow wonderful crops. I don't have to add water as frequently because the silt holds water better than the sands. And if most 
greenhouses don't want to use a very strong clay soil unless that's all they have, in which case they would add a lot of organic matter to work with the clay. I don't know what type of soils are most common where your greenhouses are. I think there's a general mix throughout the country. There's clay soil, boxitic soil, sand and loam. We have, we have um, a good mix. Okay. Right. The Galaxy A seventies hand has been up for a while, yeah. but he also he also typed a question. I'm not sure if it's the same one that he was his hand was up for. Oh, he was um, asking what type of greenhouse model should I use if I'm growing herbs. That question is not quite so easy. What <laughs> what are your goals? I can grow herbs in a plastic bag if you would like. It is difficult to get in there and work with them. Uh, I happen to be quite tall. So at because I'm six foot three inches tall, I do not like working in high tunnels that are only four foot tall, but they're much less expensive to build. So if you don't want to stand up, you can have a very small high tunnel uh, in Alaska because we are constantly having to work with uh, plastic to extend our seasons we use something called low tunnels where you never go into it the low tunnel is in a hoop right above the ground so the low tunnel might only be two foot tall they, the farmers will put them in they may be a thousand foot long but they're only two foot tall and they just remove the plastic when they want to get into it to service the crop and then they pull the plastic back over it to put it back in the high tunnel so it is not the the structure does not determine which herb you want to grow other issues are much more important how do you want to farm what do you have access to Yep, those are those were low tunnels in the picture. Another question, Jeff. Um, how do you alter the pH of the water mm. for each crop type? How dramatically do you have to alter the water for each crop type? That is very difficult to alter the water for each crop type. We would try to alter it one time for the best that works for the most crops. Sorry, Jeff, if, the question was pH, not pH, water. pH. But that's what I mean. You, I would oh. not make a pH for cabbage and okay. a different pH for lettuce. I would find mm -hmm. whichever pH works the best for everybody and then alter it. So that's if cool. you have the water that is in a smaller tank, like a 55 gallon drum or an IBC container, that's fairly straightforward. You take the pH meter, you find out what the water is, and then there are any number of appropriate chemicals that you put into the water and they will change the pH to what, whatever you want to. The pond is much more difficult. That's so much more water that that would be more challenging to change the pH. And if you want to get very sophisticated, there are systems that change the pH as the water is being pumped from the pond before it goes out into the greenhouse. But at that point, you're looking at thousands of dollars. So it is much less expensive to change the pH on a 55 gallon drum basis or a 300 gallon tank. So consider doing that on the smaller scale than on the whole pond. And that's not really that expensive. A, a small mm -hmm. pH meter is probably $50 and then whatever the chemicals that are available in Jamaica to raise or lower the pH. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's tool number one, a pH, me pH meter. Correct, and you need a pH meter for liquids rather than a soil pH meter, which is nice because they're less expensive. Mm -hmm. 
All right, great. And many of our greenhouses here a commercial greenhouse would have a pH meter that just lives in the greenhouse. They always want to know what is the pH of their watering solution. It's it's a day to day or a, a weekly decision that they're make, making sure that the pH is where they're expecting it to be. Right, so it's a lot about um, precision, right? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Precision. All right. Um. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good. Andre speaking. Go ahead, Andre. All right. Um, I have this question. Um, how do you um, spec your irrigation system based on the type of minerals or if there is um, iron forming bacteria in the water, how do you spec your irrigation system? So they are not, they, they, they serve over the life um, of your greenhouse, the longest possible life, life cycle that you can get out of your irrigation system. What kind of irrigation system do you speak of? Okay, so um, in, in Jamaica, we have um, very irregular rainfall in some areas. So there is um, heavy reliance on um, mulching and other type of dry farming. However, to improve the reliability of your crop production, I envision the need for um, storage capacity to support the crops over their lifetime um, to market. So my concern would be, how do I do an uh, analysis of the water that I have access to so that I can spec the irrigation system accordingly? So for example, if the water contains um, heavy minerals and iron forms bacteria, then there is a possibility that um, the water quality could reduce the lifespan of the um, irrigation system. So how do we go about getting that analysis? Thank you. I, I would work the problem backwards. If you have drip tape, that is the most susceptible to mineralizing or the, uh, the iron bacteria for plugging because all of the passages for water are very small in drip tape. And in drip tape, people expect to just throw it away after it gets plugged up. Mm -hmm. If you are using small drip emitters, then you can push a lot more water through there because everything is a larger diameter tube and eventually they will get plugged up. And at that point, you take them out of the greenhouse, you put them into a, a large garbage can or a 55 gallon drum and you push pump acid through it and the acid will dissolve the mineralized and then you push fresh water through it to clean all the acid out and then you bring it back to the greenhouse and you're good for another cycle until it clogs up. If you have a larger overhead irrigation, well those are so large you could probably run for multiple years because the nozzle size is so large that you will you won't clog those. So the strategy for managing the uh, hard water is what we would call it. It varies on what your objective is. So in the picture that um, Mr. Sims has put on, you can see drip tube on the far right of the image. There will be little tiny holes in that material and they'll plug up fairly quickly with hard water conditions. And then with the emitters in the center picture, 
those have a much larger diameter, so they can go much longer and run much more water through them before they clog up. Eventually they'll clog up and then you make the decision, do you want to unclog it by running acid to dissolve the minerals or do you wanna just throw it away and start over again? There are ways to manage uh, minerals in the water, but they're expensive also. So to me, it is much less expensive to manage my delivery system working with hard water than it is to take the minerals out of the system so I don't have hard water. Those are decisions that you get to make. I would advocate um, working with the hard water versus striving difficultly to get the hard the minerals out of the water. Another question, can vinegar or baking soda use to adjust the pH of the water? Yes, but it takes a lot of it. Vinegar, the vinegar that you can drink is a very weak acid. There are commercial vinegars that are so concentrated that they would be poisonous to drink. That could be used more effectively, but otherwise, the, the vinegar that you cook with, it would take a lot of it to lower the, uh, to lower the pH and baking soda actually goes fairly quickly to raise pH. They would work, it's just a more expensive strategy. They're, they're commercially available um, chemicals that are available here in Jamaica that are used to like flush the lines periodically. Yes. Jeff, so we do have we do have access to the, the necessary um, chemical for that process. So once you're up and running and you, you realize that there is an issue and it's time to flush, then you just flush. It's a process which we're not getting into the details now, but they, it's, it's available to have it done. And there's probably a season where the greenhouse is not actively needing the irrigation, and that's mm -hmm. the time to pull the system out, check all the pieces that you're not leaking, but also anything that is starting to get clogged up, it's time to flush it. True. So just like your house where you have to maintain it, you do have to maintain the, the greenhouse and um, for it to perform optimally. So that periodic um, flushing of the lines is also an important part of um, your production cycle. Simone? There are no more questions in the chat just All right. now. All right, any questions from the floor then? You're getting it. Everybody's realizing it's technical. Eh? <laughs> it's technical, but it's doable. There are other persons who are doing very well at it. So don't be daunted if it sounds you know, technical for some of you who are thinking about it. And I, but, I'm interested in knowing which crops the farmers are growing and what kind of problems they're seeing. So that as I try to help with a presentation, I know what you would like me to talk about. Is nobody going to tell me what you grow? Well, good afternoon. Actually, I joined very late. Um, I'm not growing any crops yet. I want to set up. So I don't know if you have dealt with the setup part earlier in terms of the structure. I, I get to understand that based on what you have done so far, you said a thousand US can set up a structure. So are we going to focus on setting up the system or just dealing with in terms of um, pest management, the business aspect, the soil, or we're going to look, actually look at structure. I see something about a kit. So I'm not seeing the kit. I don't know if the kit has that set up. What would you like to know about setting up a greenhouse? Well, I, I'm thinking about growing crops like cucumber and probably lettuce. So what structure, what size would be something I can work with? 
And I like the idea of doing it without electricity based on what I, yeah, so I just want to, to look at that. How large a structure do you wish to make? Well, currently I have limited land space. So I'm thinking about um, 30 feet by 30 feet. Um, I'm probably not even too big based on the, the land space. So something that's manageable, just to get the practice in. Um, actually, I'm, I'm somewhere where there's an actual structure about 50 by about 20 feet that had a pump and everything that they had removed. So I want to ask this too, with setting up that system, so I do want to know how I go about it. The, the roof, everything else is intact in terms of the, the structure, the, the covered structure, but in terms of the irrigation and everything else is out. They remove everything, including the pump. How much time do you have to put into this new business? Well, um, I, I think I have at least two to three, at least three to four hours per day. And I also get an assistant. I'm going to put it up where somebody is there 24 hours yeah. a day. So they were able to assist. Okay. Because many times when I work with growers and they want to build a 30 by 100 foot greenhouse, I tell them they have just given themselves a full time job. Oh, no, no, I didn't say 30 by 100. I said 30 by 20. Sorry. Yep. So um, that's what I mean. You've now given yourself three or three hours a day in order to keep that busy and, and make money from it. So 30 by 20. Uh, I would consider putting together three or four small houses because that way you can treat them separately. And I have no idea what the purchase of those steel kits would be in Jamaica, but you know, Jeff, Jeff, you're on mute. Hello. I'm sorry. How did I mute myself? Uh, I would consider building uh, a number of small greenhouses. They are much easier to construct. You don't have to bridge a large span from wall to wall. And you can treat each greenhouse differently that way. So if Alaska can build a greenhouse for $1,000 that is 10 foot by 20 foot, you may be able to build four greenhouses in Jamaica that would be $5,000 somewhere in that price range. And they would be 20 by 10. So you would almost get, uh, get your space that you're interested in by building three or four small ones. The construction would be much easier and you can manage them differently. So if you have a crop that needs a, a different pH, by managing each greenhouse differently, you can optimize for each crop that you're interested in. Is that a strategy that might work for you? Yes, that would definitely work. I heard you mention metal frames, but is it possible to use um, wood or, you know, cut down trees and use for the structure or you prefer or you recommend that we use, stick to the metal frames? Uh, my my growers tend to use metal frames because they don't have trees in some of the areas. If you have access to trees, by all means, use, use the local lumber. Okay, thanks. There are a number of uh, plans available on the internet for making very rough structures out of uh, lumber or trees. So there is a, quite a bit of information of making low cost high tunnels using local material and it, you just it gives you some ideas and then you talk to the carpenter people that you know and they can re help you with the ideas you can put together a, a greenhouse very inexpensively if it doesn't have to be pretty so jeff maybe okay, we need to, to to thank um thank you so much for your questions 
Maybe we need to just um, highlight exactly what is the greenhouse technology and why are we covering the plant? Can we touch on that? Can you touch on that? Uh, could you please rephrase the question? I'm not sure what you are asking. Right. So everybody is asking about the sizes of the houses. We just want to. I just wanted to explain to everybody what is the whole idea of having a plastic over pepper growing and water growing versus having it open in the field. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Are what is the benefit of the greenhouse production, which we're talking about? Everybody has different advantages and disadvantages from what I have learned in talking to uh, Mr. Sims and some of the other people. You, Jamaica has a big problem with insects. So what you are calling greenhouses, we would frequently call uh, shade houses or exclusion houses. They're screen houses uh, because Alaska is so cold we want to capture heat all the time. So we use the greenhouse to get the sun to heat the contents of the greenhouse much more than the outside weather would be. So everybody uses greenhouse and why you use them changes the shape of the greenhouse where you have too much heat when a sunny day comes, your greenhouses are probably taller than we would need in Alaska. You want that extra heat from the plastic roof to leave the crop, to go up in the air and get away from the crop. In Alaska, because we are working with such cool weather, we want the heat that the sun is giving you down in the crop. So we lower our roof down a bit so that the heat stays in the crop area. So the greenhouse is, is designed differently because we have different goals. The length of the greenhouse, that is just what the equipment that you're going to be using in there. Uh, for us, we like to be able to bring tractors and uh, two-wheel tractors and four-wheel tractors. So we try to design the house long so that we don't have to turn around so much. So that's a newbie. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so each greenhouse is going to be determined by what you want to accomplish in that greenhouse. Right. right. So, and then one of the major advantages with the greenhouse production, which is the greatest advantage, is that you can, because it's an environment that is almost fully controlled by you, you're able to produce year round. So that's one of the greatest advantage. And the other great advantage about it is because you control everything about what you put in, what you get out tends to be consistent. So the size of your fruits, you also monitor that throughout the crop so that you end up with a lot of uniform peppers, uniform tomatoes, and uniform cucumbers, whatever you're growing. So those are some of the advantages and those are some of the reasons why persons adopt to Greenhouse. We call it, I'm just using greenhouse production, but as Jeff has said, in its true definition and form, what we really have here are a lot of shade houses and protected structures. In regular greenhouse, you can drive through and reap and all of that. But what we really have are shade houses and protected structures. So the advantages, again, are that you can produce year round because you control a lot of what happens to the crop. You control the nutrients. The, 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 the irrigation, everything about it, pruning, trellising, all of those things that we'll probably discuss further. But because it's a control situation, you are able to do that on a 12 month basis if you have good um, production practices and you don't have any pests and disease issues. Yes, Shelby? Shel okay, so I have noticed um, some persons would make the shade over their crops using this black plastic. But I'm hearing you talking about, not black plastic, I, well, I don't know if it's, it's mesh, something like mesh, it's a shady mesh crop. thing. Right, I want to understand in terms of using the plastic because definitely I'm gonna take this advice to start small and use workable materials. So I want to know the reason for using the, the black thing, whatever the material is called, in opposed to the plastic plastic. The black plastic is usually called shade cloth, 
-hmm. And that's exactly what it's designed to do. You can buy 10%, uh, 50%, 80%. You can buy all different kinds of shade cloth, depending how much sunlight you want to reduce into the greenhouse. So that will keep it a bit cooler because there will be less sun coming into the crop. And some crops do not need the intense light of a Jamaica summer. So you are suggesting that it is better um, than using a plastic? No, no, it goes on top of the plastic. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. So, the, so the shade cloth goes all around the structure on the sides, because primarily it, on primarily yeah. on the roof where the sun would shine through. You're not so worried about the sides. Uh, it would be very difficult to grow crops that should have no light at all. There, uh, in in America, the poinsettia market is one of those. They will have total black curtains all the way around the house so that they can force the plant to turn red for the market. Oh. They will open up the walls for an exact amount of time to let the sun in and then they will close everything because the color is depended by the, the photo period, daylight, day night ratio. Right. I was talking about the, um, the mesh at the side in here, the antiviral mesh. Not the, yes. not the shade cloth. The I think in that case, it is to keep the insects out right. more than to shade the house. Mm -hmm. Because yes. people would put shade cloth on the roof primarily, not as much on the sides. Right. Yes. The smaller girls tend to use a lot of the shade cloth. And like, yeah. And, and, and when I travel in Southern United States, uh, a lot of the landscape industry tends to use shade cloth because mm -hmm. they may not want the crop to grow as quickly. Right. So the ornamental folks tend to use a lot of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same here. Same here. But the regular um, vegetable crop producers, this is what their most structures will look like here, Jeff. Shade cloth on the side, um, the, the roof for heat. Um, UV to allow right, and the UV plastic on top. So these are done, whether it is a metal frame or a wooden frame, most times the houses will look something like this. And with the split level, I assume that that is mesh on the top so that it will ventilate heat out very quickly. Is that right. correct or is that plastic? Yes. It's mesh. Okay, so that will, that will cool the house quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes, but but not not all of them. These are the more expensive structures, I guess. When um, Ms. Sullivan was sharing for the ones for Ms. Shelley Shelley <laughs> was sharing the ones for um four million. I guess these are the type of structures. The ones over here in the right, without this type of structure, this is made out of metal. The ones over here are made out of wood. Well, both um, prices, both prices that are quoted, it was metal, so I I was oh, getting a better good. deal than that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, good, very good. Maybe you should come to Alaska to buy greenhouse kits and carry them back to you, if we if they are so inexpensive for us. Well, this, um, Jeff, I could probably I could probably buy them online, and you said it because I'm afraid of the quality. Oh, it's not that bad today. <laughs> but um, we do our foundation. We do get a 100% waiver, so definitely when we want to buy and once we can contact you and get the kits, they can be shipped to us, and it reduces our expenses. Oh, I am just joking because the kits are shipped to Alaska and shipping is a major expense. You're much better to buy them from the regular United States versus coming to Alaska. Oh, I, shipping okay, is very I expensive for us. Okay, okay, got you, got you. <laughs> but it's a nice trip to Alaska. It's an open invitation, Shelly. <laughs> oh dear, and I'm going to have to look like I'm Eskimo. <laughs> Anyways, I'll consider it. That's <laughs> a good, it's a good icebreaker. <laughs> I we saw have plenty Mr. of Williams ice on earlier. I don't know if he's still on. 
Mr. Williams, is he still on? Oh, I think his connection is poor. All right, Ed, are there any other questions in the chat, Simone? Uh, okay, no. somebody was asking about, is treated bamboo a good material to use in mm. greenhouses? I don't know if you're familiar with bamboo, Jeff. Bamboo, I, we don't have that here, but I know mm -hmm. that around much of the world, bamboo is a major building material. So I would think that much of Asia has bamboo for their greenhouses. I don't know how long it will last in Jamaica conditions. And some organic growers are concerned by what any kind of wood would be, would be treated with. So I, I should not be the one to answer that question. Okay. I think yeah. Mr. Sims has some... said that it's not recommended. Go ahead, um, Renee. Yeah. I saw that question in the chat. It's good. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is seeing the chat to bring it up to the attention of everyone. Um, bamboo, for, for some growers, especially in St. Anne, where I've worked before, they have um, tested different types of wood and they tested bamboo and they never lasted long because um, bamboo tends, tends to break easily after it's dried and also the heavy moisture that is in the greenhouse, either through the rain or the regular irrigation of the crop and the humidity. Um, bamboo doesn't stand up that well. Also with the, 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 the joints, if you're going to use bamboo um, for the weight of the structure, it doesn't stand up well. And if you're to, to bore it so that you connect, to make those connections, as you start to bore it, it starts to mm -hmm. fall apart. So yeah, um, it's not recommended. Great. Yeah. I also realized that um, not a lot of, well, I would say about 50% of persons have already signed the register using the link. Um, I would encourage if you are interested to connect with more training information, you could just use that link. Or if the link is not opening, you could leave your email address. After you try the link, it's not working. Leave your email address and I could email the, the link for you specific because you could put your comments there. We get to see where you're from. If you're representing an organization, and we get to have your correct spelling of your name in case you're logged on with your phone, for example. You know, sometimes Samsung comes up or Nokia, right? So Mr. we get Nokia. to collect your, <laughs> collect your proper information by using the link, all right? Mr. Sims. Yes? Um, just put the link in there one more time because it's probably way up in the chat. Please. Sure, no yeah. problem. All right. And a lot of persons um, came on after it was posted. So um, you could just share the link, is, the link is now in the chat. Oh, good. All right. So um, are there any other questions from the field or feedback? It doesn't have to be a question. You can drop your feedback as well. Good afternoon again, Andre. Um, um, I, I have one other question. Now, in terms of being able to time your um, output at a time when there's not a glut, um, from your experience, because to be able, if, if I'm going to commit $5 million to um greenhouse um agricultural production right i have to ensure that my return on in uh, and i do know that for some uh, like tomato and uh, escalion and so on 
uh, they have a difficulty defending the price at certain times. And if I'm going to be using um, uh, the greenhouse type of, 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 of production, which would have invariably certain fixed costs associated with it, including depreciation, because I'm almost sure that once you have erected that greenhouse, it, it, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy to find um, alternative persons to rent it to and, 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 and so on. It's going to be difficult to demonetize. Um, how, how do we, how could we um, incorporate um, multiple crops in, in, in the greenhouse production such that we reduce the risk of an over-reliance on one crop and um, suffer losses due to um, low prices in the market? If you had not thought of the answer to that question ahead of time, why would you bother to build a greenhouse? That question is so powerful in agriculture. If you do not see an answer to that question, you probably shouldn't build a greenhouse. The whole point of the greenhouse is to be able to have a crop to hit the market when the prices are the best for the crop. If I don't need a greenhouse because outside production is coming in, there is no point in spending the money on the greenhouse. You do not want to fight in the marketplace against the growers who don't need to use a greenhouse for their production because their costs of production are so much lower. You want to have that question answered before you even consider building a greenhouse. You know what part of the year the price for tomato is the best. So then your question becomes, is a greenhouse the most effective ways to get that tomato on the market when the price is the highest? If your answer is not a strategy on how to hit the market when the price is high, don't build a greenhouse. I, I, I'm sorry that my, my answer is so nebulous, but I don't understand why you would have a greenhouse if you don't have a market for the crop before you even build it. Right. That yeah. was excellent, Jeff. Excellent um, question, discussion, Andre, because I was saying at the end of the day, are you going to be guaranteed a market? So this is where we are now. So we're discussing marketing right now. Can you guarantee that you will have a consistent market from January to December at a price above your cost of production? You guys have to answer that. You live here, you know what the market is. It's unpredictable. It's not guaranteed. So I think it becomes a personal decision for you to say, okay, am I willing to take uh, $50 per pound for three months of the year so that I can have $150 for the rest of the year. It's a decision that it has to be personal because there's no guarantees when it comes to the markets right now because of COVID and the hotels being closed. Greenhouse production has been suffering a lot. I have friends who have greenhouses and you know it has really affected them because really and truly, a lot of the greenhouse production goes directly to the tourism sector. Why? Because it's a, it's a higher quality product and it meets the bar for the hotel industry. So maybe 50% or even 70% of local greenhouse production has normally gone directly to the hotel trade. I know this, I deal with the suppliers. So it's an excellent question. Everybody should ask themselves, how am I gonna sell these produce? Do I, can I get a contract? Um, am I going to target the local market, the supermarket, the hotels? Can I get into the hotels? So it's a very excellent question. And as Jeff says, if you're not able to answer that question definitively with some amount of certainty, 
then maybe you should look at alternate um, production methods that can also use some of the technology that is used within a greenhouse. You can also use it outdoors. Maybe you can start by irrigating um, a crop outdoors as against just doing an open field rain dependent crop. So this is very interesting. And these are the, the nitty gritty questions that determine, you know, who, you know, who is suited for greenhouse production or not? Do you have another job that you can rely on when you're, when you're not producing in the greenhouse? Is it going to be your full-time job? A person who is doing something full-time versus part-time, their level of risk varies, right? Yeah. So some of the, these are the questions you have to ask yourself. Andrea had a follow-up question. No, this is Andre Anderson. Oh, um, Andre. <laughs> yeah, not, not a question per se, but I just want to say to the person who asked the question earlier that in um, your, your crop production or agriculture production in general, one of the things that we continue to make, one of the areas where we continue to make mistakes is to try to recoup the cost that we would have put in, in one crop. A greenhouse um, or shade house or productive structure, whatever it is, this is something that you yeah. should amortize the cost of maybe over 10 years. And so if you are getting two, three, four crops per year, um, you set aside a little of that cost for the cost of the house. And you look at all your other costs that go into that crop. And that is where your cost of production is going to be. And then you add your markup. So the, the fluctuation in, in price should not be something that is affecting us. And particularly, this is one of the areas where greenhouse or uh, protective structure can help because if you are able to produce consistently and at, at high output from your production, then you would not depend on the, the, the fluctuation in price that will, that will cause market price to go up and down. But what you would be doing is structure your pricing around your cost of production and then add a markup um, for, your, for your profit. And if you were to do that, one of the things that you will be able to do is to give your customer a consistent supply at a consistent yes. price and so they will not go somewhere else when the price is low because they know that they can always get from you and they will always get it at that price. And that is what is going to bring the stability that we want in the agricultural sector. Yes, good, good point, Andre, and thanks for joining as well. Um, it was the same thing I was going to share. Um, when you're a co-host, you can't put up your hand. <laughs> but um, but um, it is, the, the, the question about the, unsta uh, the instability of the market, um, a lot of persons will have it, and I think the persons growing outfield, it's more of a concern to them because they're trying to get this one crop to get back the returns. In a greenhouse, you can also be, um, be more heavily invested in hybrid seeds. And most greenhouse farmers, they do not use the regular feed seeds that are used in the open market. So it's a higher quality of seeds that would give you a higher um, production and even for a longer period of time because you are mm -hmm. providing um, water and, and all the necessary nutrients that the plant needs. So for example, um, a, a tomato plant, probably in the open field, you only harvest um, three, three times or four from it. In a greenhouse, that same plant is taking you into months and a sweet pepper, I was on a sweet, a sweet pepper, um, in a sweet pepper greenhouse that the, 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 the farmer was harvesting for close to one year, one year. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the same crop. Mm -hmm. So you, you realize that um, you get more consistent production and um, you're able to reduce your risk. So the, the cost, the fluctuation of the cost when you're in a greenhouse and you can maintain it it's, it's really negligible compared to outdoor. Okay, go ahead, um, Shelly V. You have had your hand up for a while. Okay, thank you. You're um, welcome. First of all, um, comment, commendations to Mr. Anderson in his presentation, the approach of seeing farming as a business and, and engaging farmers. <clears throat> I'm finding that this is something that they don't do. You know, they might be excited about what produces and, you know, like an hobby. And therefore, that's where they get into trouble because they don't think the process 
and really think about their cost structure, revenue stream, so much things wasting and so on, instead of using it to do other byproducts. My question though is, um, and how can I intercrop in, in a greenhouse? I understand some about it in those things. What can I grow together in a greenhouse? What can you sell? <laughs> It doesn't matter what you can grow. If you treat this as a business, the most important piece is what can you sell? I don't care what you can grow. That's just that's just a hobby. Well, what I, what I was what I was considering is in terms of um, some kind of crops might be, for example, I would know that I could grow cassava and pumpkin intercropping and because you know, whatever disease might not affect one, might not affect the other, or if I'm treating one, it might not, you know, necessarily. That is really what where I'm thinking. Is there a, so, that you do that consideration that if you do this, you might be treating this yeah. and it affects the other plant? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that is very common that plants will affect each other. I would have to uh, recommend talking to the Jamaica Extension people, talk to the other farmers, talk to the professionals that you have access to. They will know best which plants grow together grow. best. Yeah, that, that's a good, that's a good um, question, Jeff. Um, especially coming from the oh, um, open field mindset that you would try to intercrop. In greenhouses, it's really done. Um, most times it is one crop, one specific crop. Uh, I've seen minor intercroppings, but it's more likely when you're trying to do a little experiment, you probably grow, grow um, broccoli and cauliflower. You know, you might grow those two together because they're kind of similar. But most times, because the, the type of crops that are grown in greenhouse profitably, the major ones, sweet pepper, tomato, right? Those two crops, they basically stand on their own. And most times the farmers don't try to inter, um, inter, to deal with both because they do different management system in terms of how you would care for the crop. And, and it kind of complicates things when you have both of them in there. And um, with fruits and ripening, if you have um, the, your, your tomato, produce it um, ripening in the greenhouse. The ethylene that is produced by that can affect other crops that you have in there. So it's rare that you want the same consistent crop production in your greenhouse at, at um, most times. Thank you, Ranil. Um, we're going to ask. Um, I would like to go back to Mr. Anderson for a minute. There were some very powerful things in what Mr. Anderson mentioned, I have only one time seen a greenhouse pay for itself in one year. The mm -hmm. farmer built a greenhouse for $5,000 and he was able to harvest baby <laughs> greens, uh, the, the very small greens, and he sold them to the specialty market for the cruise ships. Alaska has many cruise ships, just like Jamaica does, and wealthy tourists want very fancy salads. So he sold them to a restaurant and he paid off that greenhouse in one year. And that is the only time I've ever seen that happen. And it was such a special case. The other very powerful thing Mr. Anderson said was not every crop makes the same amount of profit. It is very difficult to get a good customer. So if you're getting a hotel, there will be some crops that you are selling to them maybe at a loss just so that they don't go to somebody else when the profitable part of the season comes in for you. Maintaining a good customer, sometimes you make a lot of money and sometimes you don't make a lot of money, but it's important to get that consistency so that customer does not go to somebody else. So not every crop of the same tomatoes even, they may make much more money one time of the year and they may not make you much money than other part of the year. But having a good relationship with a good customer that pays 
That is very crucial. Okay, so the other two persons that raised their hand was uh, um, Ricardo Brown and then Anna. So you can, I'll take you in that order. Ricardo Brown, are you still there? Yes, I was asking what are the strategies I must put in place to ensure that um, fungal infection is exempt or out of my greenhouse if I'm doing crops like cucumber or the, like pumpkin. What do I do? Or um, any probably crops, zucchini, what do I do to ensure that I don't have problem with fungal infection? What we do here is try to manage moisture as much as possible. Many of the fungal infections that we have to deal with are warmth and high humidity. So we need a lot of air exchange to get the the moist air from the irrigation and from the plant respiration out of the house. Keep the foliage as dry as possible to reduce the fungal infections. You've already got shade cloth up, so you should be decreasing your viruses from coming in on insects. Uh, the shade cloth won't help for the fungal spores, so it's much more important to try to manage the environment so that the fungus cannot continue to grow as aggressively. And as a last resort, there may be some fungicides for you to consider, but it is much more cost effective to try to get good air exchange and not have a high humidity that will help these diseases. Go ahead, um, Anissi. That's how you pronounce your name? Anissa. Anissa. <laughs> yeah. Um, not so much of a, well, it's two, a comment and a question. Um, I actually own a farm store. So I supply um, farm supplies to Mandeville. And, um, you know, I find it very interesting that a lot of farmers, I think they have problems with pricing their goods. And not to change the subject from, um, from, the greenhouse but for example like I see where the cost of farming supplies go up every day um so like chicken feed goes up every single day or whatever it's it, the increase has been drastic over the years and I do I get customers every day that say oh the feed price is going up but they aren't raising the price that they sell their chickens for and it goes across the board, you know, seed prices go up every day, but I'm, the farmers aren't raising their prices. Um, so I just think that, you know, if you're in here and you have, you know, the power or the facilities to educate farmers on how to price their goods um, and how to recoup their expenses, just like Mr. Anderson was saying, that, you know, we could have a seminar or something like that to help those farmers. Um, and my question is, so once I planted some hot peppers, some scotch bonnet peppers, and I developed, this is outdoors, um, not in a greenhouse, and I developed a problem with mites. And this was a couple of years ago. And to this day, I still have that problem of mites on the land, even though there aren't any crops on the land. So I was just wondering, like, in the event that you develop a problem, like having mites in a greenhouse, is it that you would have to fumigate it? Or what would you do to get rid of them? Um, because I don't think, in my mind, I'm thinking that just spraying the crops in the greenhouse would not be enough but you can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Jeff? Once you get the insect in the area, it is very challenging to eradicate them. So that's where you want to get the population inside the greenhouse as low as possible through all different sanitation measures that you can come up with. I. I don't know that fumigation would work in a shade house because it would just leak out through the screen doors into the outside environment. But 
then you just have to be very careful about everything that you bring into the shade house. We have some farmers who take it to the extreme where they don't want any aphids in. They basically don't let anybody in their high tunnel and they will put on a disposable suit to walk into the high tunnel and they will step into a bleach bath so nothing comes in on their shoes. They're very careful about any disease coming into the high tunnel. That's, that's kind of extreme. It's more that you probably won't get rid of all the mites. It's trying to manage what you have. Everybody has to strike a balance of what effort you want to go to eradicate or manage and work with a disease. That's a, a very fundamental of integrated pest management is how do you manage it to be profitable but not spend overspend money controlling something that is not costing you uh, crop production. Okay, the next person would be Shadeen. Shadeen had a question about ideal greenhouse size. Shadeen. Okay. Next person, I think, is Andre Duncan. Don't know if you're still there. Duncan? Yes, I'm still here. Um, OK, so I realized that from your discussion, um, the two ideal crops for greenhouse production in Jamaica would be sweet pepper and uh, tomatoes. Um, which I suspect you could um, target certainly the, the rainy season, the hurricane season leading into to Christmas under your um, protected um, structure and you are likely to guarantee the best price um, for the year. What, what, what about um, cauliflower and uh, broccoli, um, eggplants, some other type of exotic um, vegetables. And how does our local cost of production compare with the imported um, vegetables? Because as farmers, our competition is not just local farmers, but certainly um, exports coming out of um, other places, in particular the U.S., which dominate our um, our local um, vegetable market. How 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 can we compete um, in terms of cost of production to ensure that we are competitive, not too not too far from what an importer would be able to um, put on the local market. That is a strategy that is thousands of years old and will continue for thousands of years from now. Uh, what sets Alaska's price is very common. All of our farmers say our price is set by Seattle plus freight. And what that means is the price that a buyer can purchase it in Seattle, Washington and freight it to Alaska. That determines our price. So either we have to produce less expensively than someone can get it from someplace else, or we have to market it differently. So we have a very strong program in Alaska that many of our farmers contribute to. It's called Alaska Grown. So this is a, a very active campaign to all of the residents saying, you should buy local produce. It's good, it's delicious, it helps your economy. So it's a marketing tool of trying to build our local economy because if you fight only on price, you're going to be probably in your case, it'll be Miami plus freight. That sets your price. If somebody can buy it cheaper from Miami, but then as a, a large part of your market in the past has been the tourists. Why, if I come to Jamaica, why would I want to have Florida food that I'm eating in Jamaica? 
I would be much more responsive to say, I'm eating Jamaica food and you would sell it to me for a premium price because you're very proud that you're selling me Jamaica food and not Florida food. I have to go back to something you said also, where you were talking about the highest price for tomatoes during hurricane season. So you said you were guaranteed the highest price during hurricane season. And I would like to ask you to think about that. You're not guaranteed anything in hurricane season. This is the most dangerous time that I can think of to have a greenhouse set up. If a hurricane comes, you lose everything because your greenhouse is smashed. So there's a reason for that high price is because the gamble is so much stronger during hurricane season. So don't think of it as an automatic, I'm getting the best price because it's that time of year. Think of the risk that you're taking if you're trying to get a crop on the market for premium prices when the environment is the most risky because a hurricane could just destroy it. There's a reason for that high price. It's, it's all about managing your risk to an acceptable level. Right. Yeah. I think I think one of the things that I know is common at the first probably would have been alluding to is that after after an hurricane, the persons who have the setup of irrigation and the and the whole unprotected structure that allows the crops to even grow back faster, they are able to re-enter the market and re-engage yep. in comparison to an open field that um will take a longer time. So usually after a hurricane, uh, not immediately, because immediately there's, there's this glut. And Jamaica is such a small country that we have these great impacts on the market for the slightest thing. And the Christmas season um, would have increased the price because a lot of farmers um, uh, produce some crops there and then uh, would, person say oh the price is high let, let me go and plant no and then you realize in, in um, two months after the price gets low because those crops that were high priced when person saw that oh, tomato is selling for four hundred dollars a pound they are they went into the market and tried to produce some tomato now it's at fifty dollars a pound so uh, you there's a big price difference when when it comes on to um, it fluctuates, a big uh, fluctuation, right? So the hurricane season is also one of those. I see, I uh, saw that hands are up. Um, um, I think sh um, the next one is for Shadeen. Mm -hmm. I think she yeah. should go next. Shadeen. Shadeen, are you there? Okay. Um. Hello. Go ahead. Yes, I was just asking, what do you think is the ideal green site for a small farmer that is starting out and would like to do this part time, but also use it as a way of making money? And it's not a hobby or a test trial. It's actually something to be profitable. The production is at a level where they are able to enter into a market or supply a market, but still on a small scale. Like 10 by 20. It is a small, it, it is a truly a greenhouse. So you will learn the lessons that are important on a large greenhouse, but it is small enough that you can keep the price down for its construction. So I, I tend to like 10 by 20 because to me, it's so inexpensive for the amount that you can learn. And it's incredible what you can produce in a house that small. Very much. Delroy? Delroy, you're on, your mic is off. Yes. Hi, pleasant um, afternoon to everyone. I've been a good listener and um, indeed I'm learning much from the presentations and even indeed the questions. 
but I also believe that um, farming to us can be an hobby. I think I think we have to start there for those who have not who have not established large scale farming, because the whole issue of pricing and profitability, I believe, is not something that is going to happen overnight. But if we continue to do it, at least we can feed ourselves. We can become good philanthropists. In other words, we can help our neighbors. And indeed, we can benefit from the, the surplus in terms of profit. But I believe that if we want to see it as a business, then we're going to have to develop a lot of what you call demand um, relationships with persons who will, will seek to take our produce. And sometimes prices is not even what matters when it comes to relationships. Once you can build relationship with the market over time, and then you can, uh, in other words, as, as, as has been said by, the, by Jeff, nothing is guaranteed because you can put in a, 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 a crop and you lose all of it um, by some natural disaster. But I believe that you have to plan for that. And at the same time, when there is positives to be gained, you take advantage of it. But most important, you develop a network where your produce can be actively sought after. My presentation, my, my input. Thank you, Delroy. Any? Some, of, yeah. some of that input sometimes has to do with which crops you are growing in your high tunnel or in the garden. When I worked with fruit trees, the farmers had the saying, apples pay the bills, peaches makes the profit. And what they meant by that was yes. apples, apples were consistent. You always knew you were going to get an apple crop and it was going to bring you a little bit of money. It was never going to be a huge amount, but you knew it was going to be consistent. So they would also have a, a peach block, a orchard of peach trees, because that's very hit and miss. Some years it will be incredibly profitable and other years you will get almost nothing. So they All manage right. their risk with the apples and make their profit off the peaches. So that's how you look at the greenhouse also. There are some basic crops that you know will pay the bills, and there are some that are the gambling crops that make you all the money when it goes right. Good, good. I think Mr. Sims made a point earlier too that, um, you know, you will have a greenhouse growing tomatoes and sweet peppers, but on this side, maybe you have somebody doing cabbages and right. broccoli right. and stuff. They're not the mainstay of the business, but at least they probably help to buy chemicals or to help to pay one or two workers for the week. But your mainstay, your peaches, are your tomatoes and your sweet peppers. And somebody made a point earlier that um, they have observed that it's mainly tomatoes and sweet peppers that are growing in the greenhouse. Um, I guess historically those have done very well and because we had access to markets that takes very large volumes, that's why um, sweet pepper and tomato continue to be the main grown um, crops in greenhouses at this time. But as Jeff says, what can you sell? We always have to ask ourselves, what can you sell? Because you can also sell um, something that is lighter, but you sell it year on. It could be herbs, whatever it is, but you're able to sell it right throughout the year versus your tomato or pepper, which has peaks and troughs up and down, up and down all the time. But in essence, price is always going to be a feature of supply and demand, guys. So you're never going to be guaranteed a high price. You have to know what your cost of production is. You can be selling at $100 and making a profit and selling at $50 and still making a profit. So don't be too focused on price. Um, you know, don't let that deter you because you basically have no control over that. The market determines that. Supply and, deter and demand determines that. The weather, hurricanes, those things determine um, how prices move. Because you know that you have no control, the control you have is what you grow and when you grow it. In working with farmers for 30 or 40 years now, I have learned that farmers like to grow crops. 
many times farmers hate to sell crops. It is much more important for farmers to learn how to market well because they love growing, but most of them can't market their way out of a paper bag. I don't know if that saying makes sense to you. <laughs> most of them have a great challenge in trying to market their crop for, the, for a good price. That is so true. Farmers will sit at home and they will quarrel about what the price is in the market and how this buys in Jamaica language, so this a buy a thief and that they buy a thief, and none of them will ever venture to the market. So you're spot on, Jeff. Farmers love to grow, but they don't love to market. So, you know. What I mentioned to my farmers many times is, why don't five or six of you hire one person <laughs> to go and sell your crops? Then maybe you'll get more money that way. <laughs> And then trust issues come into that. <laughs> That's all part of business, but part you, of business. Yeah. Marketing is an ongoing challenge in the horticulture world. Uh, okay. We're not we're not the commodities, corn, wheat, soybean, rice. For them, marketing is not as big an issue. There's a the world is a market. We grow specialty crops. You and you in Jamaica, me in Alaska. It comes down to individual marketing. How can we get good prices for the crops that we grow? Are we selling quality, or are we trying to sell as much as we can, and the quality might not be as high? You can't hit both markets. Choose where you want to be in your marketing and focus on that piece. Are you the low cost producer, or do you produce the best material and charge a premium price? They're all dis yeah, you decision get, strategies. You get the price for what you grow. Yes, and you work the other way around. Can I, accept, can I accept something of lower quality because nobody is paying me the price? Or do I have to go for the high-end restaurant premium market that will only take the best possible and not grow as much? That's all part of your marketing plan. Yeah. Which market am I going for? And I guess we all have to also look at the, as I said, the quality of our product will determine the quality of our price. So once we can determine that, then I guess we can go after, well, the effective marketing strategies that we will implement in order to get our product out there and the price that we require based on the type of demand also, I think. <laughs> My suspicion is you can make a good living with less than perfect quality. If you recognize that your customer base is not wealthy, then producing larger amounts without perfect quality and selling to your customer base at a price they can afford, you will make more money through volume than if you decided yeah. that your market is going to be the premium restaurant that only is you know, the top price, but it has to be perfect. Those are all business decisions for which market you want to go after. Create your niche. Yes, yes. very much so. <laughs> yeah. Nardian? Um, Nardian? Hey. Go ahead. You. Yeah, I want to ask Jeff this question. Um, what, I know that you're not familiar with the climate in Jamaica. How do you think about strawberries in greenhouse out here? Because that's a crop that I don't see like typical Jamaica try to do, but I, I, I consider it a good crop. You have to remember that greenhouse uh, strawberries were one of the reasons that the modern greenhouse exists. Strawberries historically would be very damaged if they ever got rained on. So there's strawberry is a very high sugar content. So if the rain touched the strawberry, the raindrop would go into the strawberry and cause the strawberry to burst. So a lot of our greenhouse technology exists because of strawberries. So they do very well in the greenhouse and they're especially to protect the crop from rain from above. So, so I know that, that they do well. So oh, so in that process, because we're trying to 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 so we're going to try what you're saying the climate out here is too hot and strawberry need a cool climate. So I just don't know. So I'm asking you on your expertise, what do you think about it? 
Uh, there are areas of California which are very hot and very dry and their greenhouses, their individual greenhouses may be a million square feet. Sorry. Wow. And those are for Driscoll's strawberry production. So there are whole parts of central California where as you drive down the expressway, all you see is solid greenhouses on both sides of the road. And they're being done in the California sun to produce strawberries to sell around the world, all under greenhouses. So I know that the strawberry will tolerate very high temperatures because California is going to get them and they make a lot of money out of those greenhouses. Okay, thanks. All right, we have three minutes to four o'clock, guys. <laughs> um, wow. Sorry, not, not to cut you guys, but um, for, the, <laughs> for the person asking about strawberries in greenhouses, yeah. I am aware of two people who uh -huh. does it. Um, one person is in, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Mandeville, one person is around Hatsfield area, I believe, that does it, and they're pretty successful with it. And uh -huh. there's a person by the name of Mr. Murray that does it, I believe, in St. Elizabeth. And I w also know of them being very successful with it. So um, I think it, it, it can work w from what they have done. No, 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 no. no, no. And so, who she wants a number? Yeah. You need to get um, runners, suckers. I think the per I think it's Abby's Garden. That yes. is Abby's Garden in Mandeville. Yes. yes, yes, I think I believe that is the name. Yes, and the person in Saint Elizabeth, there, his name is Mister Murray. Um, his wife was the principal of Hampton, and his son's name is Christopher Murray. That's all the information I have, really. Right. Okay. So there's Lester Murray, Alvin Murray, Ricardo Chambers, and Abbey Gardens. So those persons are doing strawberries and are reaping no idea. So, and based on what Jeff has said, based on the situation in California, I think um, it's proof enough that you can, you should be able to do it successfully. All right, so we're closing um shortly this session um it was an open session open discussion um we thank you for your excellent participation you did not disappoint me at all i i, I, I promised jeff that we would be good students i'll ask him if we were good students you were excellent <laughs> you were excellent students and i really wanted to thank miss noradin for having her phone because I'm watching a palm tree in Jamaica while it is snowing outside. So thank you very much, Miss Norton. I had a fabulous. burning question, Jeff. I had a burning question. Is that a real Alaska background in your background? Yes, it is my yeah, boss's hayfield. Go ahead, Norton. <laughs> I'm giving me a little view of the coconut trees. <laughs> We're not seeing it. I said I'm giving him a little view. I'm giving him a little view in the coconut. I very much appreciate the view of the beautiful <laughs> coconut trees. That's fabulous. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> well, I just drop in a final question, please, as it relates to what Anissia mentioned um, about this. So when I did training aquaponics, it still have a greenhouse structure. And we were, one of the things we learned that you can plant like, um, uh, we call it for grass, but I don't know, otherwise known as lemongrass, as well as um, marigold. So some of these help to repel certain kind of insect. And I'm wondering if this is a situation that will work all um, with all greenhouses, whatever you are doing or not, or if it's just aquaponics like I was trained. Just want to know if the application is good for general green oak. About 25 years ago, I was working with marigolds to protect tomato plants. 
uh, we were working more with nematodes and this was in Florida where nematodes is a very big issue. I did not see a strong enough protection from the marigolds to the tomato to the tomato plants to make it a commercial practice. In theory, it works good. We, I don't know that anybody has found a way to make it practical. And it certainly doesn't protect plants that are very far away. It's not like a fence that keeps the insects out because basically they'll just fly over top of it to get to what they want. Marigolds mm -hmm. tend to be fairly short plants. I've never worked with the lemongrass, so I can't speak of that one. So to me, it, it may give immediate protection for intercropping, but I'm not, I don't see yet how it could be a strategy to protect an entire greenhouse. Great. Thank and that I guess is a part of the integrated pest management. It doesn't hurt, but the benefits are not gonna be, you know, so great that you don't need to do any other treatment. Um, uh, Shall we? But there's a integrated pest management which you integrate into your whole farm, which um, I guess the marigold would help or whatever other herbs or crops that provide some protection. But as Jeff says, the research does not back it up to say it is 100% um, guaranteed. More coconuts, wow. All right, so um, we're closing at this point. Um, Elsa, Jeff, one yeah. minute, please. Um, just checking, Ricardo, you have another question? Okay. Just a quick point, um, as it relates to the crops, the two farms that you mentioned that raised strawberry have been there and what the one in Sensibet did is it plants crops on the outside to somewhat repel or crops that the actual insects go to. So I've seen him use the black mint um, around the edges of its greenhouse. And there's another plant I'm not so familiar with, which the white fly loves. So actually they go to those plants or they use the black mint to repel on the outside of its operation. So that's what I've seen um, locally. Right. Great, thanks Ricardo. So you and use I, every I method possible. I have seen possible. a lot of power when I you think... have the trap crop. Mm -hmm. So the repelling black mint works even better when there is is something that you want the insect to go towards and you plant that nearby. Oh. Then you have a combined effort where you're trying to direct the plant to something other than what you want. So the trap crop is a fantastic strategy. Excellent. Thank you for that, Jim. I'm not sure if Andre or Anissa. Okay. Uh, I saw Andrea didn't lower his hand. I don't think they lowered their hand after they spoke. Huh? Okay. All right, sounds good. All right, so we can begin to think about um, our next session. Um, the sessions were not, you know, pre, pre, or we didn't say no, <laughs> pre-organized because we really wanted to hear from you today exactly where you are, where, where, um, where we go next with the series. So the same method that was used to advise you about this training, uh, we had tentatively set next week, Thursday. Uh, I'm cleared fully with Jeff. Um, Ronnie, you can probably You're chime ready. in at this point what the plan was. Yes, great. I'm happy that a lot of persons are on who um, would benefit from learning persons who are already in the field and what they're doing because originally some of the partners that we have for this training as is the flyer, um, Noranda Baxat Goras, the pictures that I showed in terms of the structure, their setup, what they've been doing, um, they've been in an operation for um, a number of years now and they, well, we have met with them and they expressed some of the things that they're doing and would like to improve on. And we are in the process now of hearing what's going on and also helping on the ground. So majority of the trainings, um, well, some of it will be tailored towards what they're doing 
in terms of a specific operation on the ground and also some of the greenhouse growers from Manchester who are also on this evening. So you will be hearing and getting the chance to see live persons and live farmers what have tried, what hasn't worked. There was some challenge why some of them are not on this evening. But we expect that going forward, that possibly in another three sessions, we could overcap some good agricultural practices, what has worked, um, what is recommended, uh, what is best, right, for, for the greenhouse growers. The ones who are in production, it would be like a refresher or sometimes an, a new knowledge for the ones in production and for the ones who are on, who are interested, it would be, okay, well, I don't have to make that mistake because I'm actually learning from persons who are in the field, learning what is good, what they're doing, and um, you save your time and you save your money. So I'm encouraging all persons, whether or not you are actively planting, to come on for the other sessions with similar Zoom links. And we, the producers from Naranda, they have agreed to be on for next Thursday. That is confirmed already. So um, we'll follow up. Um, behind the scenes and ensure that we put together something that um, everyone would benefit from. All right. Uh, pardon me, please. Don't want to impose on it. Will, will we be taping and uploading these sessions on um, YouTube or some other? Yeah, th there's a need for, there's a need for permanence and open source so that one, we can tap into it to we can share with with others, you know, as we as we push um, certain um, production and certain marketing strategy, we 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 will not have the luxury of being able to always um, have an expert um, <laughs> and, and and so on, but certainly yeah. um, open source. Um, information Definitely. and demonstration um, even if it is not local but if you could send us some links where we can go to see things you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah. awesome <laughs> that would be no, that's no, a good that's point that's a very good to, point andre right the link to very jeff to see jeff in action yeah, yeah, I promise at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> you see when you see jeff jeff is an expert i told you he really is. He really is. And we love, we love Jeff because he is practical and he is so relatable. Having not been to Jamaica, how he's able to kind of understand our limitations and, you know, advise us in ways that within budget, within budget. Yeah. yeah. Within I, budget. I'm, just, I'm just very worried about the title of the YouTube video, which might be <laughs> Alaska advice for Jamaica growers. That's just going to be silly. <laughs> It will grab attention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, and, and the recordings, the recordings would be shared. I like what you're talking, Andre, and uh, we we have systems in place, and you'd hear more about them further along uh, for YouTube, and also we share the links for the recordings that you can watch on your own time as well. And um, as Ms. Johnson mentioned, Marsha mentioned, Jeff, Jeff is a great YouTuber. Uh, he can tell you or type in the name of his YouTube channel. You can go on and see what he's doing over in Alaska. And he has made some videos. Great I watched stuff. a couple great of stuff. them. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Fantastic stuff. So we see each other next week, Mr. Sims? Yes, definitely. Thursday. Thank you, everybody, for sharing your afternoon and evening with me. It is great fun to talk to the warm climate. <laughs> can, we have a round of, can we have a round of applause for Jeff, please? Definitely, Turn your mics definitely. on. <laughs> After three, definitely. one, two, three. We're going to say Irie. One, two, three. Irie. 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 What's up, Jeff? Irie, Jeff. Ari, yeah, man. Ari, Ari. And who's going to tell Jeff what Ari means? <laughs> Jeff, when you say Ari, it means it good, man. It good. Wonderful. Yeah, Thank man. you.
It is yeah. good, very good. <laughs> and Jeff, you can answer by saying, yeah, man, yeah, man. <laughs> I, already, I already do, yeah, man, yeah, man. <laughs> You can also send level the vibes. Aye, all right. <laughs> level the vibes.